Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this important webinar. We're going to wait a moment to just let people usher in, and then we'll start in just a few seconds. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, again, thank you so much for joining this important webinar today. My name is Arielle Pallets. I'm the executive director for the city's Office of Nightlife. For those of you who don't know, we are a dedicated non-enforcement liaison between the city and the nightlife industry. In addition to our focus on safety and harm reduction, which is the purpose of this webinar today, we also work to support nightlife businesses through the opening and operating process, as well as recovery. We help to resolve quality of life issues and relationships between venues and their neighbors, as well as elevate and promote nightlife culture. As always, if you have any issues or questions about your nightlife venue or neighbor, feel free to reach out to us at nightlife at media.nyc.gov. We'll have a slide at the end. Today's webinar is part of a new series of courses the Office of Nightlife launched called Night School or Nightlife Industry Training and Education, which is held both virtually and in person. This is a series to share resources and trainings for owners, workers, as well as patrons, addressing how to best engage with city agencies and how to improve safety and quality of life. You can find out more information about all of our nightlife courses at nyc.gov slash night school. That's N-I-T-E school. The safety and well being of the nightlife community is a top priority for the office. We know that our nightlife spaces are places where people can look out for each other and where we all do our part to create safer spaces. And that is what we are doing here today to make sure people know, just know how to party safer. As it is often the case when we are talking about health and safety issues, I wanna make sure to note that these incidents unfortunately can happen anywhere at any time in any setting, not just nightlife. We're not talking about nightlife problems. We're talking about light city issues where we can all just be better prepared. It is important to be as prepared as possible when going out at night or wherever you are. Anything can happen anywhere, anytime. So it's up to us to stay vigilant and to be aware of our surroundings and um, to be conscious at all times. So we encourage you to be a harder target by taking some of these preemptive measures and to keep yourself safe. That is why we have asked our partners from the Anti-Violence Project or AVP to be here tonight to give a presentation on how to stay safe in New York nightlife. And we're excited to partner with them to bring us some tools and tips. But first, before the, we do that, we're also extremely pleased to be joined by another partner and champion for nightlife safety and the LGBTQ community, my friend, our council member, Eric Botcher. Council member Botcher, thank you so much to you and your staff for being such a strong voice on this important issue. And everyone, please help me welcome council member Botcher. Oh, thank you so much, Ariel, really appreciate uh, you and your office for taking a leading role on this issue. I also want to thank AVP for all the work you're doing to help keep people safe right now. I've said that I think New York is in a, a golden age of nightlife right now. In my district alone, in Council District 3, we've had a number of new establishments open, particularly with the LGBTQ community, 
We've got a number of uh, queer nightlife uh, establishments that have opened in Hell's Kitchen. And it's been an exciting time, especially after going through the pandemic that we've been going through and all that time inside. It's so great to be out and with other people and experiencing all the reasons why we live here in New York, the electricity in the air and, and all the excitement. But we've also had um, some unfortunate um, incidents, right? And that includes the number of overdoses in New York that have reached all time highs. And it's been happening around the country. It's been happening here in New York, partly attributed to the presence of fentanyl in all kinds of recreational drugs. And people are dying and, and getting very sick. So people really need to know the facts about that and be armed with the tools to help keep themselves uh, safe. Also, we've had some really terrible incidents of people being victimized in nightlife venues. Um, the horrible uh, cases of people who've been um, uh, killed and, and drugged and the authorities have uh, made some arrests, they've made some indictments against people who've done this, but there's other cases that are still unsolved. Um, Julio Ramirez and John Umberger, who were both found dead after attending, after uh, leaving nightlife venues in Hill's Kitchen, we are still um, awaiting news on that investigation. And while the authorities assure us that they are um, um, actively investigating this and that they have all possible resources assigned to bringing the people responsible for that to justice, we wanna make sure that everyone has the information and, the, and, the, and knows all the tips and has all the tools to keep themselves safe when going out and enjoying New York. And that's what this forum is about. In addition to all the information that we've been putting out, all the flyering, all the, all the uh, conversations we've been having with patrons and establishment owners, this forum is really to make sure that everyone has all the information to keep themselves safe, to keep their patrons safe. So I really wanna thank um, Ariel and all your colleagues at the Office of Nightlife and, and everyone at AVP for, for putting this together. Thank you so much, council member. And we really appreciate your partnership and your love of nightlife um, in New York. Uh, it is truly why we're all here. We love it. Um, and it's important to make sure that it's safe for everyone. And with that said, um, I'll also mention our Narcan Behind Every Bar program, which is in partnership with the Department of Health to help all nightlife workers as well as patrons be trained on how to administer Narcan um, in the event of an unintentional overdose in a nightlife space. So please also find that information on our um, night school agenda and we will drop a link into our chat as well. But really, the best thing is prevention and knowing how to keep yourself safe. And New York City street smarts is really the way uh, to do it. And that's why we brought in AVP. So without further ado, um, I'm going to uh, introduce the AVP team to conduct this training. But a, a quick housekeeping note is to please use the Q&A feature in the Zoom to let us know your questions throughout the meeting. And after the presentation, we'll have additional time to answer the Q&A. This meeting is being recorded and live streamed to Facebook and a recording will be made available to share with staff, colleagues, and neighbors um, who were not able to attend this webinar. So 
Uh, now I'd like to introduce today's training and the team at AVP. I'm proud to welcome Audacia, as well as Aditi and Ori. Thank you very much for being with us today and for sharing this important information. Thanks so much. Um, AVP is so happy to be here today. Um, my name is Audacia Ray. Um, I take they and she pronouns. I'm the Director of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy um, at AVP. And um, I will also ask my co-panelists to introduce themselves. I was waiting for Ori, but since Ori was probably waiting for me, I will introduce myself to everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Aditi Bhattacharya. I use she and her pronouns. I'm the Deputy Director of Client Services at AVP, and I am just so happy to be over here. Thank you for having us. Ori, now over to you. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Ori Givens. I'm the Director of Communications for AVP. I use he, him pronouns, and very happy that we could join you all and uh, partner on this really important topic tonight. So just a bit of an overview of um, how we're going to proceed through uh, about the hour that we have together. Um, so we wanted to share some of the bar safety tips that um, we have generated um, over the years. Um, and then also talk, um, so talk specifically about um, how patrons um, can um, use different um, tips and tactics um, to stay safe, to think through um, how they want to move through the world and nightlife. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about um, safety planning for venues. So if you are a bar manager or um, a nightlife host, um, that section is for you. Um, we also will talk a little bit about how we look out for each other and some de-escalation tactics. Um, so this is, a, you know, being safe in bars right now is a extremely complex and uh, sensitive topic because we know that we're talking um, both about um, the situation that has been ongoing in, in Hell's Kitchen um, with folks being drugged and assaulted um, and robbed. Um, and we are also talking about the um, bigger picture safety of our LGBTQ spaces, um, particularly in, in the wake of the shooting in Colorado Springs. So um, this training is meant to um, give you some things to think about, some questions to be asking yourselves, your friends, your colleagues, um, to start to think about what, what does it look like to make safety together? Um, and I will turn it over to Aditi to share a bit about AVP and the initial round of safety tips. Sure thing. So a little background about who we are and what we do. Um, AVP is the largest organization in the country right now that does anti-violence work that serves LGBTQ and HIV impacted survivors of all kinds of violence. You can see our mission over here states that our, it is to empower LGBTQ and HIV affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence. And we do that through organizing, through education, through direct support of survivors, through counseling and advocacy. Um, something that is specific about AVP's background that makes it unique to um, other folks who are doing anti-violence work, whether that's in New York or even nationally, is the all kinds of violence. So typically, anti-violence organizations may stress on domestic violence, on trafficking violence, on sexual violence, etc. But in reference to and in response to the realities of where communities that we serve come from and their locus of experience of harm. We also look at a sort of global understanding of violence and the intersections of violence, whether that is familial, that is community of choice or of origin, systems that are involved in perpetuating harm and violence, and then compounding that to cause survivorship in very particular ways for LGBTQ and HIV impacted folks. And we do all of our anti-violence work 
work, whether that is through organizing, through direct services of counseling, of systems care and advocacy, also known as case management. Um, we have a bilingual 24 seven hotline. You will see the hotline information repeated across the rest of our presentation to you. Um, but just as a reference, it's 212-714-1141. Um, we have a vibrant uh, hotline training program that in fact is going on right now. Our, um, our Jan Feb cohort actually started just a couple of days ago. So we're in the thick of uh, training a new batch of people to become certified rape crisis advocates and hotline volunteers. So we have all of these different platforms and gateways, if you will, to connect with community and for community to connect with us. Where our work intersects with each other is the work that Daisha does through organizing and advocacy with their team, connects with community on the ground. And such as today, we provide education, we do outreach, we also get the pulse on where community is at and what their needs are. And these pieces of intelligence, if you will, formed and sourced from community also intersect with in very organic and meaningful ways with the information that we glean from community members who are experiencing violence or have witnessed violence and want to report it for themselves or for people that they care about. Um, through our hotline program and from other organizations that may refer survivors of violence or LGBTQ or HIV impacted to come and work with us. So we work very closely with each other. Another very important vertical to our work is the legal program. So we have um, attorneys and paralegals that do all manner of civil and um, family court advocacy and legal representation, um, again, on issues that intersect with violent survivorship for members of community in New York City. Um, I think I have covered pretty much all of the major verticals um, that we take care of in ABP. Um, I do want to emphasize the last part about our approach. We aspire to and hold ourselves accountable to doing anti-violence work in a way that is anti-oppressive and is deeply and profoundly trauma informed. We know that survivors know what it is that they need. They know what they have been through and all of the work that we do in all of our different departments is very much centered in um, advancing the needs of community that is informed by them and for them. Who should I be kicking it to next? Oh, it's still you. Okay, it's still me. All right. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the safety tips. Um, in the spirit of doing the work, something that we um, do sort of as the ground up in all of our outreach work, anti-violence work is really understanding practical and community-centric ways that um, respond to the needs of community and how to keep themselves safe. So in the space of nightlife, knowing as where we are right now and how we're located both in the vibrancy of nightlife um, that the council member mentioned and also the very real reality of the many spaces and the many ways in which this exposure to an engagement with nightlife can also open us up to all manner of risk. Um, some of the techniques and some of the tips that we're offering you right now are understandably super practical. Um, and some of it is fairly self-explanatory. Use your tech and alert your friends of where you are. The alerting, and this is something that has come up if any of you have been involved in any of the movements and the activism work that has been so vibrant in the last three, four years, this is something that has come up in those spaces as well and is therefore informed by the same. Um, you may have a couple of people you consider chosen fam or you consider people that you are close to. Um, let them know where you're going. Let them know from time to time where you are. Let them know if you are okay. Um, give them 
have an agreement with these people or even this person of whether there is a safety word that you want to use, uh, an innocuous safety word that you may want to text to them, or if you want maybe a set of numbers that you want to send them, or you know, a way in which you come up with the code that lets them know and you know that perhaps you are in a situation where you are not feeling safe and they would need to intervene or would call you or would, and you know, would, would work with whoever is the venue administrator or the manager or something to that effect, they were able to escalate the situation and get more people involved. When you are, if you are with a group of people, again, same thing. If this is not connecting with somebody who's not in the space with you have one person um, that perhaps you trust if you are in a group of people who you can keep abreast of how you are doing and you can also connect with them and make sure that both of you are keeping watch on each other's activities and just checking in from time to time to make sure that everything is okay and that you are feeling well in the space that you are in. The second one that we recommend over here uh, is super relevant, passcode, is not face ID to protect your phone and your data. So face ID is super easy um, and is super, at this point in time, ubiquitous. Um, however, using old school, if you will, techniques um, and having to, and making sure that you use a passcode and a sort of, I guess, in the, same, in the same vein as any password, one that is not like a whole host of zeros or one, two, three, four, five, but something perhaps that is more personalized to you, make sure that you use that over Face ID because Face ID evidently is easier for someone to use. They can scan your face without your consent um, and when you are not aware. And that is something that could then open you up to more tech violence. And, and this is just an easier way to sort of scale back in the, you know, in, in, in the scale of technology and access to scale back a step to make sure that we can lock in a little bit more safety for you. Um, folks will use substance and you are, and in the spirit of trauma-informed care and community-informed care, you know what your limits are. You know what you need to do to keep yourself safe. Be mindful of how much you are consuming. Um, and if you are deciding that you are going to consume more, um, then again, going back to safety tip number one, make sure that someone that you trust and you can stay in contact with is able to make sure that they check in on you um, so that your whereabouts are known, your status is known, and you are as grounded and as situated as can be in that particular space. And the last one, really is the most important in all of our trauma work. I am a clinician and I work with clients and with community members and direct services. And this is something that comes up in all of our counseling and hotline work multiple times. One's gut does not lie. So if you are in a situation where you are not sure of who you are with, if you get what I call itchy tummy, trust itchy tummy. If you are feeling somewhere in yourself, in your body, that something is not feeling right, then trust that instinct. All of us in community who are in public spaces and have been in, you know, and, and have and live vibrant social lives, um, we know if something is off. And that gut instinct really is something that one can never underestimate the value of. So if you feel like something is off, again, going back to safety tip number one, um, whoever is your safe person, let them know. Um, and I guess, yeah, just follow your gut instinct. Um, and something that I want to also include over here, and I know that this will come up in, our, um, in the later parts of our conversation, is feel free to connect with AVP. Our website has easy access for people to report if something is going on for them, our hotline, and we also have text chat available on our hotline. Um, know that there is always availability for you to contact the hotline and to speak live to a person um, who is able to then in the moment safety plan with you as well. We have had people who have contacted us from the bathroom or 
um, have gone into a separate room or a separate space. And I can also say that even our hotline volunteers, in fact, one of my, my direct supervisor and one of our um, oldest serving staff members, if you will, um, with AVP. She joined as a volunteer herself with AVP for the hotline and is now the director of client services. She has taken calls when she was in nightlife as well. So members of community are doing community stuff when they are also addressing hotline calls. And so you can rest assured that if you contact us, you will speak to somebody live who will be able to actually connect with you in the moment and can do some very on the ground practical safety planning for you if you are unable to reach your safe person. Thanks so much, Aditi. Um, so those uh, tips that Aditi shared um, are also available in um, a tip sheet um, that has a couple of additional um, pieces of, of information on it um, on our um, bar safety landing page on our website. Um, we'll drop a link um, to that. Um, you can download um, a pretty version of the tip sheet. Um, and also if you work in nightlife, um, we're going to share some more information about how you can access um, deeper resources to um, support your um, your patrons and staff and other people in the space. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, you know, bar safety is becoming uh, much more complex. Uh, is certainly not just about individuals. Um, making sure that they are taking care of themselves and their people, but also um, for venues and hosts to really think about um, what goes into um, keeping a, a space safe for LGBTQ people. So um, we want to share a little bit from some of the venue safety planning work that, that we've been doing um, over the past couple of years. Um, one thing I'll say about this is that this um, this is also an entire training of, of its own. Um, if you are a host or a manager of a nightlife venue, um, AVP is um, happy to come through your space and do training with staff, um, hosts, community members, um, and um, we'll also share that that link that can be accessed from um, the uh, bar safety uh, link. Um, or I think there's a, a drop down thing that's happening that's blocking up the screen. Um, so in thinking about venue safety planning, um, there are kind of three main things that we encourage um, staff and hosts and managers um, to think and talk about um, amongst themselves, amongst the folks who are making decisions in your space. Um, and also, um, you know, your staff, um, so folks are informed about uh, the conversations that you're having. Um, really the most basic, most useful, and uh, honestly most overlooked piece of doing safety planning for your venue or your event um, is having that kind of like internal map or even like drawing it out on, on a whiteboard um, or a chalkboard or something of um, who are the community members um, and the neighbors around your venue that could be called on for support. Um, and particularly in thinking about um, off hours, nightlife, um, how would you connect with folks? Like, is there, um, you know, I know that next door can be um, a pain, but is there um, other ways that you connect with other folks in the neighborhood? who know your venue, support what you're doing, um, and are concerned about the safety of your space. Um, so just talking to people, even having like a WhatsApp with some of the other um, bars in the area, um, I think is, is really helpful because um, that way you can share information about like if there's a, a problem patron who has been circulating um, or um, a pattern of, of robberies or other things that, you, that folks have been seeing locally, um, just sharing that information um, among each other is, is super, super helpful. Um, the second thing um, that we um, advocate that, that folks do um, is something called a venue environmental scan. Um, and this is something that ADP can also um, walk alongside you in doing. Um, and so this is basically just thinking about, um, 
you know, we all have uh, fire safety plans also in, in place, but thinking about like, what are the um, entrances and exits? Um, who's on staff on, on a typical night? Um, how do you communicate with them on the floor? Um, and really thinking about the, the kind of little quirks of, of your space. Um, and um, in the, the worst case scenario that even thinking about um, how would you do an emergency exit? Where are there places where folks could hide or create a barrier? Is that the bar? Is that um, tables or, or some other part of the space? Um, so that's one of the things that, that folks think about um, when they're doing that, that venue environmental scan. And the thing that's tricky about um, scanning the space is that a lot of our spaces change on a very regular basis, depending on what kind of event is happening. So it's something that um, needs to be done on, on a regular basis to really think about, okay, the way we have it configured tonight um, means a different thing for how people move around the space. Um, the last thing um, that we uh, strongly encourage folks to talk about um, within um, their, their staff and communities is what are your thoughts and feelings about involving the police? Um, the police um, in, in New York uh, have a, a long history of um, anti-BIPOC and anti-LGBTQ actions. Um, a lot of us know that the police are not necessarily there to support us. Um, and a lot of us have had great success with um, involving the police um, and, and helping them to, to keep us safe. Um, and uh, one thing to be aware of is that in New York City, there is um, LGBTQ um, NYPD liaison um, who can be very helpful if you, um, particularly if you contact them in advance. Um, they're not the folks that come when you call 911, um, but when you reach out to them and reach out to Community Affairs um, has an LGBTQ unit, um, those folks can be super helpful in helping you um, make a safety plan and um, instead of um, being caught unprepared and, and thinking on your feet, really thinking through um, who are the folks in your community that you would call, um, including police, um, what is going on in your neighborhood, in your uh, environment, in your, in your venue um, that can uh, support people in, in getting to safety and um, what are the things that, that could be barriers. Um, so, uh, that's a, a very small taste of um, how we think through uh, this, this venue planning, safety planning um, for spaces, for events. Um, and like I said, we're more than happy to help um, and support folks do this um, very specifically with their own staff and their own space. Um, okay, if you can move to the next. Thanks. Um, so we also uh, really stress that um, this is a, a community process of, of looking out for each other, supporting um, everybody who's, who's in the space. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to share with you all um, is this, uh, this uh, de-escalation, the series of de-escalation tactics. So one of the trainings that um, ABP offers is um, called a bystander intervention training. Um, and it's specifically designed for folks in public transit and public spaces um, when they see harassment or harm happening um, and want to do something about it, but don't want to get hurt and want to help de-escalate and help people move along. Um, so I'm going to share the, the five Ds piece of this, which uh, I think is, is a very helpful set of things to know um, for um, anyone who's, who's out in nightlife and public spaces. Um, thinking about uh, ways to uh, manage the situation and um, try to uh, de-escalate something that's going sideways. Um, so the thing that most people think of most immediately um, in um, a, de a situation that needs de-escalating um, is that they think about um, directly confronting the person who is making a fuss, causing harm, um, or harassing someone. Um, so that's the, the kind of go-to um, form that, that people um, go to um, when they're thinking about um, how to interrupt a situation. Um, it is actually not always the, the best way to um, 
to reduce violence um, because it can actually sometimes escalate depending on, on what's going on, um, who the person is, um, who is harassing or causing harm. Um, it can actually um, escalate when you directly challenge that person. So some of the other things that we wanted to offer up as possibilities um, are some of these other four Ds. So um, delegate is the second one. Um, in a situation where you're in a, a group space, um, one of the things that can be um, most helpful to do is to look around and see who's there um, and delegate different tasks to different people. So um, you could turn to someone and say, hey, can you go let the bartender know that, that something wild is happening over here while I keep an eye on the situation? Um, we really encourage people to think about the ways that um, this is a, a community and participatory process um, and not a moment for people to be saviors or heroes, to really think about what are the resources around you um, and who are the people around you that can um, step in and help. Um, the third one is distract, um, which is a, a personal favorite of mine. Um, so uh, in a situation where there is uh, harassment or harm happening, um, the first goal really is to de-escalate, to make the moment break um, so that the harm that is happening completely stops happening. Um, and one of the ways to do this is actually to create a distraction. Um, some of the examples that we use, particularly in um, public transit, are like asking people for directions, um, you know, making a noise in a different part of the space, um, doing something performative and confusing that just um, really just breaks the moment and makes folks look away and look at, okay, what's happening over here? Um, and that can give you a chance to um, move the person who's who's being targeted out of the space um, and, and create a moment that just shifts um, what's happening. Um, in any kind of situation where there's um, harassment or harm happening, um, the goal is not actually to get the person doing harm to see the error of their ways, it's just to get it to stop. Um, and distractions can be very helpful in that way. Um, the fourth one, delay, um, is really focused on kind of doing aftercare. Um, so one of the things that um, is really important to think about when um, a situation is unfolding is, um, how to uh, make sure that the, the person who's receiving the hate um, knows that, that other people are there for them. So um, this can be used in conjunction with uh, a lot of the other strategies and um, can help folks to um, just kind of check in um, after something has been de-escalated to see how they're doing, what kind of support they need, um, and really can just be as basic as, hey, I saw that, that was fucked up. Um, I'm here if you want to talk it through, um, or do you need support getting home or, or anything like that. Um, the last one is document. Um, and this is, you know, in the, the age of everybody having a camera on their phone, um, something that is, is extremely prevalent. One of the things that we really encourage um, is that documenting um, a situation playing out um, can be very helpful. And also um, the person who is being targeted, the person who's the survivor of a situation um, should be asked about what they want to happen with this. Um, they might not want to um, and upload something to the internet immediately. They might want to sleep on it. They might want to send it to friends to share or um, just think about how they want to use it or think about if they want to use it and sending it to press. Um, or they're a city council member or anything like that. So um, part of the process of, of doing this work is um, really supporting the person who's being harmed and making some decisions about um, what they want to happen to restore um, their sense of, of safety. Okay, can you move to the next, um, uh, move to the next one. Um, so uh, before we get into uh, giving people space for, for questions, um, I wanted to share one of the, the upcoming things that um, ADP is working on. Um, so in addition to offering trainings and support um, for um, both people who are attending um, nightlife venues and people who run them, 
um, in the form of trainings like this one and, and the more specific ones um, that you can access for your particular space. Um, Ori has put together a really great set of resources um, that can be um, distributed to your space. So um, we can have them posted up in your space. So we have um, these great posters that are good for um, hanging near bathrooms or other waiting spaces that have information about the AVP hotline as well as um, QR code for folks to, to link to um, information about um, getting support. Um, we've also um, created uh, bar coasters, drink coasters um, that we can distribute, um, as well as stickers with information about the ADP hotline and our bar safety tip sheets. So if you um, work at a venue that um, would like a package of these, we are doing a bar safety kit making night um, next Wednesday, February 8th um, in the ADP space. Um, and so uh, you can use this email community at adp.org um, either to RSVP and say that you want to come and help assemble some kits, or if you work at a venue um, and would like a package to be delivered to you with all this stuff in it, um, you can also email that email address and um, we will get them on their way to you after next week. One more slide to go. Um, so this is a, a this uh, image on the left is is what the um, poster looks like, um, and those are uh, included in in the uh, distribution of the kit that we're distributing. Um, and this QR code um, leads you to the registration page um, if you want to sign up to to join us um, for that that evening of um, assembling the kits. Um, as it gets warmer, we're also doing a lot more um, bar outreach. Um, in Hell's Kitchen um, and also in, in other um, spaces, other neighborhoods and boroughs. Um, so um, if you uh, work in any neighborhood in, in New York City and, and want us to, to come through, um, not just to, to um, give out these kits to the bar itself, but um, also for us to talk with patrons, um, we are more than happy to do that. And um, again, you can email us at, at community at EDP um, for us to do that. Um, so we are happy to have um, feedback and uh, questions. Uh, my question to you all is how do you think um, these different strategies, the strategy of um, educating um, venue patrons and managers and thinking about de-escalation tactics, how do those things um, work together uh, to create a safer environment for our communities. Well, thank you so much for this extraordinary and important uh, presentation today uh, by AVP. We um, at the Office of Nightlife really do see the importance in partnering with our community-based organizations, as well as with council member Eric Botcher today to really amplify the incredible uh, resources and important resources and information that already exist um, to help nightlife places be safer spaces and to help look out for each other. Um, our purpose really is to gather this information and amplify it. Um, we all know that uh, nightlife is really an asset to our city and not always as it's historically been perceived as a liability. And um, these conversations and presentations are um, extraordinarily important now more than ever, as they say, especially as our vibrancy is coming back. And um, I'm not sure if we have any questions right now, but What's important is that people know how to reach you um, and how to reach us, whether um, it be on creating safer spaces for the LGBTQ community, um, learning how to use Narcan um, and making sure we have them behind the bar, bystander training for harassment prevention, active shooter response training, and also just helping businesses 
uh, navigate city bureaucracy to make sure the industry and community know that they're supported and loved and cherished by our city. Um, yes, we have, uh, you've dropped in some requests for training information. You wanna share what you just shared in the uh, chat, please? I don't know who dropped it in. Aditi? Oh, yeah, that that was me. Um, no, just just to share it out with the the, the full group. Um, so it's it's a link to more information about um, our our safety work and specifically the trainings that we're offering. Um, and so folks can um, go ahead and and access that um, on the website. Um, you can also use our website to report incidents of, of violence. So it's not just the hotline. Um, you can also do that online. Um, so those are, are different ways that folks can access um, ADP. And I'm gonna drop the, the hotline number um, one more time as well. Um, so folks have that and can uh, paste that into their phone. Um, Ori loves to ask people to just uh, save um, the hotline number in their phone. Um, so I think, you know, we hope that you never have to use it, um, but it is there. Um, the other thing that I'll say about the hotline too is that um, folks think of EVP as, as being accessible when folks are in active crisis, but actually one of the reasons that um, folks call the hotline most, most regularly is to get help with safety planning that's specific to the situation that, that they're in and what their life looks like. Um, so that's a really helpful resource and um, you know, doing some safety planning can, can help support you in um, making choices you need to make um, to move th through life. Um, and so you do not need to be in active crisis to access ADP services. Thank you, that's a really important point. The whole point of this series of webinars and trainings is really about being proactively prepared and being able to um, foresee any issues and how to create safer spaces um, if you're an owner or even just how to be more prepared as a patron or performer in the nightlife space. And um, we really appreciate the important work that you do and for being with us here today. And we'll be hosting more with you in the future. I encourage everyone to follow the Office of Nightlife on social at NYC Nightlife Gov. Sign up for our newsletter on nyc.gov slash nightlife because we're always hosting new webinars and trainings and sharing information that can be relevant to you. And uh, just know that this is a dedicated non-enforcement office to support the nightlife industry and community um, and to really appreciate everything that you contribute and to help support you with the daily challenges of running a business at night. Um, so again, we thank um, everyone who joined us and taking their time today uh, to council member Eric Botcher and his incredible work in support of the nightlife and LGBTQ community, team nightlife at the office of nightlife and um, wishing you all well, stay safe and healthy, and until we meet again, thank you so much.